As darkness settled over wood and heath, tank number 801 also withdrew from the battlefield. Back to the orchard, into Biding, out in front, the last burning tank was signalling yet another unsuccessful attack. Once more the push to the coast had been a flop. Hasn't it yet dawned on those chairborne gentlemen way back that we are facing a powerful enemy here who can't simply be thrown back into the sea just like that? The skipper of one of the tanks asked. It was a question asked by many in the evening of June 9th, when it was obvious that a thrust to the coast was now out of the question with the forces available to individual divisions. Obergruppenführer Sepp Dietrich, the general commanding the 1st SS Armoured Corps. Under his command, Panzer Lehr had been placed as the only army division, ordered Bayerlein at Langevre to prepare to defend the Tilly area. The line Christo Tilly Verrier La Belle Epine was to be held as the main front line at all costs. There was no more talk about counter-attacking to the coast. It was a turning point. Dietrich's order was undoubtedly correct. It became obvious that the main weight of the British offensive was being switched to the Tilly area, since Montgomery had been unable, in spite of exceedingly heavy casualties, to capture by direct attack the important road centre of Caen. Montgomery drew the inevitable conclusion. If he could not achieve his objective by frontal attack, he must try to attack from the flank. This meant advancing from the Bayeux area to Tilly, gaining the high ground of villers bocage and thence wheeling towards Caen. A new chapter was opening in the Battle of the Invasion. Its name was Tilly, the Battle for Tilly, on June 9th, when the Panzer Lehr Division was thrown into the defensive battle for Tilly. This modern fighting unit, wholly designed for mobile armoured warfare, was faced with unexpected tasks. Its zone of operation was the Bocage undulating ground, crisscrossed by hedges, dotted with clumps of bushes, and interspersed with large apple orchards and pastures. It was not unfavourable terrain for defence. The high banks, with their bushes or lines of trees, parcelled up the landscape into hundreds of small rectangles, offering hiding places and cover. But they also made observation difficult. Infantry units were able to establish themselves in the many sunken lanes. In this way, the various defensive sectors could be set up in echelon. On the other hand, they had no contact with one another, and the answer to these problems was the tank. The tank became the hub of defence. A weapon designed entirely for attack, assault and rapid advance became a means of defence, an armoured anti-tank gun or an armoured machine gun. This new use gave rise presently to an entirely new fighting technique and also to a new type of fighter. The invasion battle was moulding tactics and fighting men no less than the battles of encirclement in the east, or the improvisations outside Moscow, on the Don, and on the Volga. In Normandy, the individual tank became the nucleus of infantry units, the infantry platoon, the company, the combat team. They were all based on the tank. Without tanks, no position was taken, and without tanks, no position could be held. Local counter-attacks against enemy penetrations, or for the recapture of tactically important ground, were almost invariably led by individual tanks. The Panzer Lehr, to whom Guderian had once overconfidently assigned the proud task of throwing the Anglo-Americans back into the sea single-handed, found itself forced into an entirely new mode of fighting. The division had been created as an elite unit for offence. Now it was being expended as a defensive unit. Its splendid fleet of 750 armoured and superbly armed infantry carriers had to be put in store. They were being kept at a depot 60 miles behind the fighting front, 750 armoured vehicles. Armoured divisions engaged in static defence. It was an exciting but also a depressing chapter in the history of the war. The episode that follows is typical of many four Mark IVs moved off noisily. Their skippers had only pencilled sketch maps to go by, and the order, position to be taken up along this road. Tanks to be well camouflaged, a good field of fire to be ensured, sector must be held. Make sure you get into position before you're spotted by fighter bombers. And then they were off. Five men were inside the tank. Outside, the infantrymen were clinging to the turret like a cluster of grapes. Tanks advance, hard to the right, use that bank for cover. Nobody suspected that their little outing would last a fortnight, 14 days and nights on outpost duty in the La Belle Epine area. It was like a game of Red Indians, only deadly serious this business of hide-and-seek to evade the sharp eyes of the fighter-bombers. Once a tank was spotted, it was done for. 
Mercilessly it would be dive-bombed and attacked until a bomb or a volley of cannon fire had finished it off. The enemy's superiority could be met only by cunning. Corporal Westfall, the skipper of the tank, got out to reconnoitre along a sunken lane. He crawled through the hedges. He inspected every inch of ground. He had moved up and down the lane about a dozen times. You'd think he was choosing a building plot, Lance Corporal Hoffman, the wireless operator, said with a grin. Well, that's what it comes to, said Hameler. The loading number. Better a building plot than a tomb, Brechneider, the gun layer, agreed. At last, Westfall had found a spot to his liking. Reese to right and left, two men moved off in opposite directions. They found their two neighbour tanks in well-camouflaged positions, to the left that of Corporal Schultz, to the right that of Corporal Pausch. Last in the line, with the fourth tank, was Captain Felmer. They were concealed in sunken lanes, in orchards and in haystacks. The infantrymen around them were camouflaged by bushes, sheaves of oats and broken-off branches and twigs. The gaps between the tanks were rather wide. Even so, they had to try, in the event of an attack, to halt the enemy's armoured spearheads from their concealed positions. A mile behind them was the armoured reserve. If the outpost line was pierced, that reserve had to counter-attack. The first few hours were spent in camouflage. Branches and twigs were carefully cut out of a hedge, and the tanks decorated with them until they seemed to have been spirited away. Time and time again a man would go off to see whether the camouflage looked genuine. Then he would say, a bit of the turrets still showing, or a caterpillar lynx still glittering in the sun, and so on. Until at last he was satisfied, all right now. Next, the tank tracks in the field of oats had to be obliterated, or they would be a clear signpost for any fighter bomber. Laboriously, each blade was bent back again and made to stand upright. The first two days were tolerable. Water for washing and hot food were not yet missed. The men in the tank were not yet getting on each other's nerves. They still slipped cheerfully through the floor hatch and crawled out underneath the tank to replace the withered camouflage branches or get a breath of fresh air at night. Inside the tank, two men stood or sat by the glass all the time, ceaselessly scanning the ground in front, What's the distance to that bushy-topped tree? There was some dispute and argument, then they agreed, and to that big bush in the hedgerow, and to the far corner of the oat field. Mentally, they surveyed their whole field of fire. They became familiar with the distances. In an emergency, they would not have to spend long calculating. The time was 2 p.m. on their third day. Alarm, Tommies, the men were galvanised into action. Lance Corporal Ross, the driver, had his eyes glued to the glass. Ten Tommies with a man-handled anti-tank gun. They're crossing the field now, and they're taking up position. Two men coming up with ammunition boxes. Shrapnel, the skipper ordered calmly. 400 metres, fire. The 75mm shell burst right in front of the anti-tank gun. Three British soldiers were still alive and were now racing towards an apple tree with low, spreading branches. Turret 11 o'clock, fire. The top of the tree was torn to pieces. Fire. The tree trunk was shattered. Fire. There was nothing left but a tangle of smashed branches. Cease fire. They slid out through the floor hatch. They rearranged their camouflage. They were looking serious, and they knew that things would soon be getting very hot for them. An hour later, the British artillery spotting plane was above them, circling round, searching, and then it came at first only a few roving guns did the ranging. But presently they were under concentrated fire. Hell was let loose. But it is not easy to hit a small tank in a big landscape. True, the field of oats was ploughed over. The hedge was torn to shreds. There was a continuous thumping against the sides of the tank. Death knocking at the door. Shortly before sunrise, the shelling increased in pitch until it was a veritable hurricane. The outer plates and the additional armour along the sides were riddled like sieves. The blankets draped around the turret with their twigs and greenery had been swept off. Smoke shells, Hamill called out. The smoke screen outside was thickening. Visibility was less than ten yards. Any moment now they would come. They could not see them, but they knew. Fire, the four steel fortresses on which depended a stretch of the main front line outside Tilly, were no longer concerned with camouflage. Now it was a time for fighting. The turrets swivelled. The guns belched forth their shells. Machine guns ticked. Infantrymen fired from their foxholes underneath the branches and from behind trees.
Fire and steel were hurled into the smokescreen, open hatch, a quick look through the binoculars. The barrage is creeping forward, said Westfall. Now the infantry would come. They were not to be endangered by their own gunfire. Fire. The ground shook. The branches along the bank waved as in a hurricane from the blast of the gunfire. The summer sun of Normandy had vanished among clouds of dust and smoke. Gradually the smoke screen dispersed. Where was the enemy? He did not come. Four tank crews and a few dozen infantrymen heaved a sigh of relief. At once they set about replacing their camouflage. It was their eighth night. The skipper had just changed places with the gun layer to snatch a quick nap. His head resting against the eyepiece, Westfall dropped off immediately. Pass the shell case over, the gun layer said to Ross. None of them laughed any longer when they heard the intimate noise. Then the floor hatch was opened and their martial chamber pot emptied. At the same moment there was a thud outside. Crash. They jerked up and again crash. That was not artillery fire. Those were the shells of tank guns. One of them burst quite close. Start engine. Engage reverse. Full speed astern. Faster. The skipper tried to get back into his seat but it was impossible. Are we still following the hedge? They came to a halt beneath a massive spreading oak. Shells were bursting in its boughs. Branches came clattering down. The next tank in the line was firing. Once, twice, three times, then silence. Had they finished off the Tommy, or had the Tommy merely made off? They could not ask because of the radio silence. The thirteenth day dawned over the bank and the hedge. The men felt as if they had been put through the mill. They could no longer bear to see one another or to smell one another. Thirteen days of hardly being able to stretch. Thirteen days without a drop of water to wash in. Thirteen days crowded together in a steel coffin. Only their watchfulness remained. Every day the skipper scanned the hedge through his binoculars, foot by foot. Now he was looking at a small bulge. Surely that bulge had not been there yesterday. And one twig there seemed a lighter green. He focused his glasses carefully. So that's it, a Tommy? For an instant he could make out the flat steel helmet under the camouflage migs. Where there's one there are bound to be more. The gun layer ranged his gun. On target? Karl Brechneider nodded. Load shrapnel fire, 40 metres less. But now the barrel of an anti-tank gun emerged from the hedge, so that was it. They had better shoot accurately now. The tank rang with the noise of the last shot, 10 metres farther to the right. Can't you see the barrel? Now the British gun began to bark. It had aimed at the tank's muzzle flash. The shell swished close past the turret. Which of them would be faster? For once, Westfall's tank was lucky. On the following morning, in the grey light of dawn, they were relieved. Unless a man has spent fourteen days and fourteen nights in an evil-smelling tank on outpost duty, he cannot know the simple bliss of returning to base, digging himself a comfortable hole in the ground, chucking in some blankets and then rolling up in them and going to sleep. From afar came the sound of gunfire, the bark and swish of the fighter bombers' rocket shells. They did not care. They did not care the least bit, so long as they were not ordered. Mount tanks, immediate counterattack, tank skirmishes. During the night of June 9th-10th, the defence of the Tilly area was taken over by the units of the Panzer Lair Division, all of which had at last arrived. The outpost line was at the same time the main front line. It ran from Cristo, near the Combayeur Highway, via Tilly North and the Chateau of Verrières and Bernières, through La Belle Epine and Torteval, to Saint-Germain-d'Ecteau and Anctoville. Thus, a line of no less than ten miles had to be covered and held by a single division. Divisional headquarters were in a farmhouse at Semonteau. Because of the danger from fighter bombers, elaborate precautions were necessary. The radio transmitters had been set up a few miles away. This made it impossible for the enemy to pinpoint the headquarters by direction finding. During the day, no motor vehicle was allowed within a radius of 500 yards. All tracks and tyre marks had to be carefully obliterated, and only thus could a headquarters escape the attention of fighter bombers and of artillery directed by spotter aircraft. Only a few days previously, the higher commands had been taught a terrible lesson. On June 8th, Rommel, anxious to clarify the chain of command, had had General von Geyer appointed commander of the entire sector east of the dives as far as Tilly. With the three armoured divisions now available to him, the 21st, the 12th SS and the Panzer Lair, he was at long last to mount the counter-attack to the coast.
At last, the commanders in the field breathed. In the afternoon of June 9th, however, the general's headquarters in the Chateau of La Cane, four miles northeast of Thury Harcourt, was attacked by fighter bombers and wiped out by carpet bombing. The enemy had pinpointed the headquarters by direction finding of its radio traffic. The chief of staff, General von Dawans, and twelve staff officers were killed. General Van Geyer and Major General Pemsel, the Seventh Army Chief of Staff, now in command of a corps of the Federal German Army, escaped by a piece of good fortune. But the planned attack could not now be launched. It was the end of June before a new headquarters staff was set up and the officers were ready to take over their duties. The land around Tilly did not favour defence by infantry. The grenadiers of the 1st and 3rd Companies of the 1st Battalion, 900 2nd Regiment, for instance, bad taken up positions on slightly rising ground. Shortly before dawn, 2nd Lieutenant Bombach had inspected the positions together with the battalion commander. He was not encouraged by what he saw. Because of the stony soil, the grenadiers were not able to dig in adequately and were lying instead in quite shallow troughs, laboriously scratched out of the hard earth with only a few stones to protect their heads. Things got going towards 5 a.m., Sudden concentrated artillery bombardment. The hurricane of fire lasted 45 minutes. Unprotected, the infantrymen were lying among the hail of shells. It broke their nerve. A few men leapt to their feet and ran back. Others followed. The position was in danger of crumbling. Lieutenant Ritter stood up to check the panic. He rallied the men and led them forward again. Fortunately, the bombardment was not followed up by a charge. Just before noon, five tanks rumbled past the farm house where battalion headquarters were established. They looked like German panthers. Then one of them halted, the turret was opened, the skipper looked at the conventional tactical sign marking the farmhouse as a battalion headquarters. The tank's barrel swung across, crash. These were not German panthers, and now they were really in for it unless there was last-minute help. Second Lieutenant Werner with his company of Panzerjagers was in position near the farmhouse. A few days previously, some new self-propelled guns had been delivered to him. Here was his chance to test them. Within 15 minutes, he had shot up three of the five British tanks from his hidden position. The others got stuck, their crews bailed out. In vain, they tried to fight their way back, past battalion headquarters, with pistols and submachine guns. After some of them had been killed, however, the remainder put up their bands. A second lieutenant with a face wound turned to Bombach, saluted and in precise school German declared, I surrender. About this time, as 2nd Lieutenant Werner was cracking the tanks of a Scottish regiment west of Tilly, General Byerline, driving round the open plain north of Tilly, spotted a strong force of British tanks bivouacking in the most peaceful manner. Hart Dagen, go and get anything you can find, the orderly officer dashed off. He mobilised four Panthers and two 88mm guns, that old wonder weapon which had ensured so many successes in Africa. Byerline was in his element. He positioned his force at a favourable range, well camouflaged. Then he commanded, Fire! The British combat force was like a stirred-up anthill. The vehicles careered about in wild confusion, and into the melee smashed the shells from the Panthers' rapid-fire guns and from the Righty Eights. But the battle did not remain one-sided for long. The British blanketed Bayerline's force with one of their characteristic artillery bombardments, heaviest calibres, including naval guns. After all, they could afford it. The Panthers and the 88mm guns had to disappear in a hurry. It was always the same. Cunning, gallantry, and even self-sacrifice invariably had to yield to superior power. In the evening, Lieutenant Colonel Zeisler, the missing battalion commander in the Panzer Artillery Regiment, returned to Bayerline's headquarters. Together with Colonel Luxenberger and the NCOs and men of a patrol, he had been surprised by a Canadian tank detachment and taken prisoner. For no obvious reason, this Canadian detachment had behaved in the most brutal fashion. The violence and fanatical ferocity of the invasion battle, which led to excesses on both sides, had culminated here in a particularly ugly incident. During the general beating up of the German prisoners, Zeisler had slipped away into the undergrowth and had later made his way back to the German lines. His account was borne out in a horrible and deplorable fashion on the following day. The one-armed Colonel Luxenberger was found severely injured on top of a Canadian tank, which had been knocked out by a German anti-tank gun. 
He had been tied to the turret. Three days later, he died in a German field hospital, Cherry to Lemon. Come at once, the expected British full-scale offensive came on June 11th. It began with a powerful tank attack on Tilly. Captain Phillips, now a parson in Gladbeck, repulsed the British with units of 901st Panzer Grenadier Regiment. A second thrust was aimed at verrieres langevre Verrières was lost. British scouting cars were already emerging from the large patch of woodland north of the town, advancing towards the road and sneaking up through pastures, fields and orchards. The armoured reserve of the Panzerlehr Regiment now mounted its counter-attack. The steel colossi of panthers and tigers rattled through the narrow streets of Langevre. Screeching, they swung on to the secondary road outside the shell-wrecked church. They turned into a farm track and rumbled on towards a patch of wood about 300 yards away. Action stations, close hatches, all they could see of the hedgerows and ditches, of the fields and the edge of the forest, was a narrow strip through the bulletproof kin on glass which covered the vision slits. Both guns loaded, safety catches on, the gun layer reported over the intercom. The machine gun and the long 75mm Fiat trajectory gun were ready for action. Second Lieutenant Theo was a troop commander in the 6th Company, and the skipper of the 3rd tank which bore the code name Lemon. Attentively, he watched his front, ahead of him, advancing in single file along the narrow farm track, were three tanks of the company. Now they turned left, they skirted the edge of the wood, rumbling past the tangle of tall hedgerows, clumps of shrubs, thick patches of undergrowth and gnarled old apple trees. Second Lieutenant Theo was following them. Now the three tanks in front were burning across an open field into the wood. Instantly hell broke loose. Enemy armour, turret 11 o'clock, fire. These were the commands Second Lieutenant Theo heard in his earphones. They were the orders of the skippers of the tanks ahead of him, a loud bang. Theo entered the open field, and now he could see what was happening. On the path leading into the wood stood a smoking Cromwell tank shot up by Cherry. Billows of smoke rising behind the wreck suggested that other Cromwells, those new, highly mobile British tanks, were withdrawing under cover of a smokescreen. Suddenly, a Sherman burst from the hedge on the right, but immediately turned tail and vanished in the thick undergrowth. Theo sent a shell behind him. Most at once he found himself under fire from the left. He turned his gun towards the outlines of a tank just visible behind a hedge, direct hit. There was no movement from the direction of his victim. Evidently the crew had already abandoned the tank. The Panthers and Tigers stalked the enemy through the thick undergrowth, but opposition from the British was getting stronger. They were feeding reinforcements of tanks and anti-tank guns into the patch of wood. The commander judged correctly that his task was not to allow his tanks to be knocked out one by one in the treacherous thicket, but to prevent the enemy from taking the village of Langevre. The battle swayed to and fro for days. Finally, it looked as if the British had given up the attempt. Lemon, 2nd Lieutenant Theo's tank, had taken up a rest position in a farmyard on the village street. Corporal Martins was in the kitchen, supervising the giant frying. Pan in which an enormous peasant breakfast of 15 eggs was being prepared for the five men. Abruptly, the village came under heavy bombardment at the same moment over Lemon's radio, which was left permanently switched on. There came a desperate call for help from Cherry. Cherry to Lemon, I am surrounded by enemy infantry. I am unable to move. Come at once, Lemon. Repeat, come at once, Lemon. The peasant breakfast was flung into the sink. Blankets, haversacks and personal kits were snatched up and tossed into the tank. Engines started. Out from under cover, they got their weapons ready for action as the tank lurched out of the farmyard. Everything was done automatically. They saw the trouble as soon as they reached the field track. Cherry, which had been on picket duty, was standing motionless by the hedge. British troops were all around the tank. Theo opened up at them with his machine gun and another burst. The tracer struck the muddy ground right in front of the tank. The British infantry scuttled back to the wood, but now armour piercing weapons were opening up on Theo from the edge of the wood. Undeterred, Theo's men got out of the tank. Under direct fire, they made fast the steel hawser to Cherry. The troop's second tank was now coming out of the village and took over fire cover. It received a hit at once, but it continued firing. The tow line was secure, off, steady now. Even so, the tow line snapped. From the edge of the wood, the enemy was firing as hard as he could, every time smack into the bank, 
Why on earth don't they aim higher? muttered the wire, less operator of the broken-down tank, as, together with Second Lieutenant Theo, he pulled the steel hawser over the towing hook. Off, Theo ran in front of the tank and directed the towing manoeuvre down the narrow field track and through the anti-tank barriers at the edge of the village. The battle for Langevre was getting fiercer. The British were using phosphorus shells for the first time, which, in addition to their explosive effect, caused terrible burns from their three-foot-high searing flames. In a counter-attack against British tanks which had broken through the line, Cherry was finished for good. Lemon was also damaged. Two more of the company's tanks were set on fire by phosphorus shells. The crews bailed out. They rolled over in the dirt to extinguish their burning uniforms. Amid the crash and roar of the artillery fire, the wounded were packed on top of the last still mobile tank. The injured grenadiers and tank crews were cowering on top of its stem. Most of them had C. Veer burns. Many of them were naked because helpful comrades had Tom the burning uniforms off their skins and thrown a blanket over their raw flesh. They were screaming with pain as they burned about on top of the tank, close to the hot exhaust pipes. Their screams did not cease until the hypodermic needle blissfully entered their veins at the main dressing station. When General Bayerlein arrived at the flanking strong, point of saint germain d'Ecteau in the afternoon of June 12, Lieutenant Thiers, the commander of the division's escort company, produced for him three prisoners. Bayer Line was amazed to see that they belonged to the 7th British Armoured Division. They displayed the red jerboa on their sleeves and on their captured vehicle, the Devi Pchichenel sign that Bayer Line knew so well from the African campaign. So Montgomery's desert rats, those tough and cunning desert fighters, had also turned up. This meant that except for the 51st Highland Division, all Montgomery's elite troops were now in Normandy. And in the face of that evidence, the German High Command continued to doubt that the operations in Normandy represented the Allies' main blow. Bayerlein took the prisoners along in his Volkswagen Jeep to his headquarters for his intelligence officer to question them about the intentions of the 7th Armoured Division. Suddenly the General Beard, his orderly officer behind him, roaring with laughter. And what's so funny, Hartdagen? With a broad grin, Hartdagen pointed to one of the prisoners with a face like a horse. Herr General, do you know who that is? How should I know? Bayerlein grunted. This man, Hartdagen announced dramatically, this man is the chief undertaker of a London cemetery. A great pity, the General remarked. A great pity we've got other things to do. I should have enjoyed a chat with him, but instead, the intelligence officer bade a long chat with him. But B, of course, was interested not so much in the cemetery as in the undertaker's business, as a member of the 7th British Armoured Division. The undertaker was a chatty man. He told his captors that the desert rats bad already penetrated deep into the flank of the Panzerlehr Division and were pushing farther and farther into the still empty gap between the British and American bridgeheads. If that is so, the intelligence officer remarked, then our situation is damned serious. If the desert rats get into the rear of our division, they may well cause our lines to collapse. The very next day, June 13, confirmed his fears. While Montgomery was still battering against Tilly and Longuevre with tanks of 50th Division, thus tying down Bayerlein's armoured reserves, a combat group of 7th Armoured Division quietly slipped past Bayerlein's flank and penetrated as far as Villa Bocage. The British advance was discovered by Obersturm, Flera Mikkel Wittmann in a Tiger Tank of 2nd Company, SS Heavy Tank Battalion, 501st Regiment. Wittmann, the company commander, was an experienced tank man. On the Russian front, he had knocked out 119 enemy tanks, and he held the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. The strong detachment of Tigers bad been moved from the Beauvais area via Paris to the invasion front on June 7. The second company bad been caught by fighter bombers near Versailles in the morning of June, one rank SS troops equivalent to lieutenant. Since then, they bad moved only at night on June 12. They had reached the neighbourhood of Villas Bocage. The morning of June 13 had been set aside for servicing and maintenance. Bomb damage bad to be repaired and the transmissions overhauled after the heavy flogging they bad suffered during the long journey. Meanwhile, Obersturmführer Wittmann set out with his old gun layer, Obersparfeuer Woll, to reconnoitre the ground. Emerging from a small patch of woodland, be noticed enemy tanks moving along the road towards Hill 213, 
north of Villers Bocage. Carefully, Whitman withdrew to the edge of the wood, he observed. He counted. That was no reconnaissance detachment. That was an entire assault force, and it was moving into the rear of the Panzerlehr division. But what could a single Tiger tank do about it, or, for that matter, the company's four other Tigers? The only ones which Whitman bade still available for action after their forced march and the heavy bombing? But Whitman was no ditherer. This was an occasion not, or calculation, but for action. One Tiger against a whole brigade, a British armoured column was driving through Villers Bocage. Though Whitman did not know it, it was the spearhead of the 7th British Armoured Division, namely, the 22nd Armoured Brigade and units of the 1st Infantry Brigade. Among them were the famous 8th Hussars, the 1st Tank Regiment, and the 5th Artillery Regiment. Through his binoculars, Whitman could see that the British were meeting no resistance in Villers Bocage. The supply units which had been stationed in the little town had been overwhelmed the day before. The bulk of the British force continued along the high road, towards Hill 213, in the direction of Caen. It was a hazy day, and there were no fighter bombers or rank in SS troops equivalent to corporal. The reconnaissance aircraft was in the sky. Even so, the British were displaying an astonishing degree of unconcern. One motorised infantry company had stopped by the road. Sighed, it was a company of the 1st Infantry Brigade. They're acting as if they'd won the war already, Whitman's gun layer grumbled. Whitman nodded. We're going to prove them wrong. Calmly, he issued his orders. As if by a thunderclap, the quiet of the morning was rent by the Tiger's 88mm gun. The leading British tank, only 80 yards away, immediately went up in flames. Like a gigantic beast, the Tiger burst out of the wood and swung onto the road. In top gear, it raced straight for the enemy column. Then it stopped, it fired, it moved on. It stopped again, it fired, it moved on. Whitman drove past the armoured spearhead of the British brigade. Shooting up the vehicles, tanks, trucks, armoured infantry carriers were all in a jumble. The way ahead was barred by the shattered and blazing tanks in front. Behind them, the half-tracked vehicles had closed up too much. Whitman was pounding the vehicles with his gun and machine guns. All the half-tracks, as well as a dozen tanks of regimental headquarters and the reconnaissance company, were reduced to scrap. A Cromwell tank swung its turret round. Its 75mm shell slammed against the armour plating of Whitman's Tiger without inflicting any damage on the giant. The Tiger's 88mm gun finished off the Cromwell. Gunfire was now also coming from Hill 213. It came from Whitman's four remaining Tigers, which were knocking out the reconnaissance tanks of the 8th Hussars as they tried to give covering fire to their comrades. Meanwhile, the noise of battle had alerted the 1st Tiger Company. Hauptsturmfuhrer Mobius moved off with eight tanks which had been standing by. Together with Wittmann's tanks, he first outflanked and then broke into Villers Bocage and destroyed the Cromwell tanks still in the town. In vain did Major French, rank in SS troops equivalent to army captain, the commander of a British anti-tank detachment, try to avert disaster. One of his guns was firing out of a narrow side street. A tiger swung towards it and rammed the house on the comer. The house collapsed. The gun was buried under the masonry. The tiger merely shrugged off the rubble and the beams and, moving in reverse, rumbled back to the main road. Only one of Major French's guns scored a lucky hit. The track of Whitman's tiger was blown off and the giant lay motionless. Whitman commanded, Bail out. At the head of his crew, he fought his way back to his company. Mobius's tanks fought a running battle with British infantry in the township. The fighting surged through the narrow streets. The Tommies were resisting desperately. From basement windows and doorways they fired their bazookas and infantry weapon, not unlike the German Panzerfaust. Untersturmführer 1st Stams and Oberscharführer 2nd Kriegs Tigers received direct hits and were burnt out. There was no time for their crews to escape. Furiously their comrades swept through the streets. This engagement in Villers Bocage on June 13 remains one of the most spectacular episodes of the invasion battle. A dozen tigers against an entire brigade, against Montgomery's famous Desert Rats. In the British record of the war, the engagement appears as the Battle of Villers Bocage. The British chroniclers claim seven tiger tanks destroyed. Evidently, they counted a few old Mark IVs left behind in Villers Bocage as tigers, a pardonable mistake. 
Since defeats and retreats all too easily lead to incorrect counting and inaccurate reporting on both sides, but the numbers did not matter. The main point was that Montgomery's armoured thrust into the rear of the Tilly line had been stopped by Michelle Whitman's Tigers. A dozen Tigers had won a battle. The British were still dazed by the pounding they had got from the tanks when in the early afternoon German infantry made a sudden charge against Villers Bocage from several sides. These were advanced units of General von Litwitz's 2nd Panzer Division, which was being moved into the area between the British and American invasion sectors in order to reinforce the Panzer Lehr Division. Litwitz's infantry penetrated into the town from the south. From the north, a combat group of the Panzer Lehr Division attacked with two 88mm guns and three field guns. Lieutenant Colonel Kaufmann, Bayerlein's energetic chief of operations, had realised the danger of the British. Flanking movement hurriedly scraped together various rearward formations and personally led them into attack against the British. Street fighting in villers bocage continued until the evening of June 13, then the British abandoned the battlefield, withdrawing the remnants of their battered units to Livry. But they did not salvage much, the entire headquarters personnel, as well as a company with 27 tanks and all the tracked and wheeled vehicles of the armoured brigade, were lost. The brigadier, 15 officers and 176 other ranks had been killed. The 1st Infantry Brigade left four officers and 60 other ranks on the battlefield, but Montgomery's plan had not been confined to the attack by 7th Armoured Division. The flanking thrust at Caen was linked with a direct attack on the Tilly Line, this was to tie down Bayerlein's forces and thus divert them from the outflanking manoeuvre of 7th Armoured Division. It was this flanking movement against the rear of the Panzer Lehr Division, which was to have been the main blow, bringing about the collapse of the German front. Now that the action at villers bocage had ended in failure, Montgomery had to try to convert the pinning down operation at Tilly into a breakthrough. After a tremendous preliminary artillery and aerial bombardment, the 50th British Division, reinforced by new armoured units, launched its full-scale attack in the morning of June 15. The main brunt was borne by Captain Phillips, the defender of Tilly. With units of 901st Panzer Grenadier Regiment, he repelled all attacks on the town. There was furious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was a battle decided chiefly by the Panzerfaust, that new weapon of the Grenadier, the Mark 42 machine gun, and hand, grenades. Tilly was held, but Langevre was lost. La Belle Epine, though stubbornly defended by an armoured reconnaissance unit under Major von Falois, likewise fell on the following day. The battle moved too. Wards its climax, the men of the Panzer Lair now beard the noise of battle on their right flank too. In the Puto Brouet area, held by the 12th SS Panzer Division, the British were likewise attacking, it was their 49th Division. On June 16, the British crossed the tilly Balleroy Road on a broad front. Strong detachments captured Hot Tot. On the Caen-Comont Road, the situation was getting dangerous. General Bayerlein was then at the headquarters of 902nd Regiment, in whose sector the enemy had made his penetration. The 1st Battalion, Panzer Lehr Regiment, subordinated to the 902nd, was under the command of Major Markowski. He must retake Hot Tot, Bayerlein ordered. The Major had not even waited for the order, but had at once alerted his battalion. Prepare for counter, attack. After a brief preliminary bombardment, 15 Panthers rumbled off with grenadiers riding on top. Markowski was right in front. Furiously, the long barrels thundered, the machine guns chattered, the anti-tank guns barked. By nightfall, Markowski had dislodged the British and retaken Hotot. He himself was seriously wounded. Casualties among the grenadiers were heavy. Dusk fell. The ghost, like ruins of Tilly, towered into the sunset of June 16. Without pause, the 50th and 49th British divisions were charging the cornerstones of the German front as if there was nothing more important in all the world than to capture these bombed-out, gutted villages, V1's streak over the front. At the very moment when the British were battering the defences of Tilly and Christo, the German High Command suddenly struck at London, Britain's metropolis was in utter confusion. Air raid sirens were wailing ceaselessly. Mysterious unmanned missiles were streaking through the air from the Calais Dunkirk area at a speed of nearly 400 miles an hour and bursting in or outside London. 
The V-1 had arrived, the rocket age had begun, a few minutes after midnight on June 15 through 16, Hitler had unleashed his latest hound of hell. 24 feet long, with a short wingspan of 16 feet, plain and squat such were the fire-belching monsters which carried a ton of high explosive. For the first time in their history, the British found their capital under bombardment from the continent. The attack did not take them by surprise. All along, the British Secret Service had been fairly well informed about the progress of German long-range rocketry. Search and the development of the V-1 On August 17, 1943, the British struck. A force of 597 aircraft attacked Pienemunda, the centre of V-1 production. The effect was catastrophic. When the bomber fleet made off, the dead bodies of 735 men, including a number of leading technicians, were littering the wrecked site. Production was thereupon switched to the Hartz Mountains, some of it to underground, bomb-proof factories. But Churchill's Secret Service discovered the move and remained currently informed about progress. The first V-1 was to have been launched in December 1943, However, British intelligence located the launching ramps and smashed 35 of them with 3,000 tonnes of bombs. The next German date was February 15, 1944, but the ramps were smashed again. Eventually, Lieutenant General Ernst Heinemann scheduled the beginning of the V-1 offensive for the night of June 12 through 13. Colonel Wachtel, the commander of 155 TB Flak Regiment, which was in charge of the V-1 operation, had misgivings. He wanted a few more tests on the steering mechanism, but Heinemann stuck to his date. That this date was anything but a secret is shown by the fact that a day previously, on Sunday, June 11, the planned operation was known in London. In the morning of June 12, the acting head of the British Secret Service informed the senior commands of the Royal Air Force that employment of the V-1 was imminent. Meanwhile, Colonel Wachtel's gunners worked feverishly, the first salvo was scheduled for 20 minutes before midnight, but firing had to be postponed to 3.30 a.m. at last, shortly before 4 a.m. The first 10 V1s roared off their ramps, but it was a very unlucky start. Five of them exploded immediately after takeoff, and the rest only just managed to get across the channel. General Heinemann at once called off the operation and postponed the offensive to the night of June 15 through 16. This time all went well. The snorting monsters roared off 55 ramps. By daybreak, 73 V1s had burst in the area of the British south coast. A gloomy and anxious House of Commons heard the Home Secretary report about the attack of malignant robots. The German High Command, however, placed all its hopes in the new wonder weapon, the Retribution Weapon No. 1, previously referred to in the blueprints as Phi-103 or under the code item of Cherry Stone. Hitler intended to break Britain's fighting morale by a ceaseless bombardment of her capital. He believed he could wear down the British government into surrender. That was why he refused and continued to refuse even in mid-June, to direct the first rocket in military history against the concentrations of invasion ships off the Normandy coast or against the embarkation ports in southern England. There, the new weapon might have had military effects, it might have disrupted Allied supplies, or possibly even cut them off. At least the Allied naval units would have been forced to withdraw from the French coast, which would have eliminated the murderous naval bombardment that was ceaselessly pounding the German defences from 640 barrels. A V-1 bombardment of the landing beaches would anyway have had a severe psychological effect, especially as the Allied forces in the field were known to be sensitive to artillery and aerial bombardment. But no, London was to be softened up instead, it was a fatal miscalculation on Hitler's part. The total absence of German operations against the enemy fleet off the invasion coast was ironically emphasised by the sudden concentrated fire which British naval guns opened on the divisional headquarters of the 12th SS Panzers, 17 miles southwest of Cannes, on that very June 16, the day that saw the opening of the V-1 offensive. Sturmann Hans Matiska, a driver attached to divisional headquarters, had just driven Gruppenfehrer Seconduit's command car into the forecourt of the chateau, after some minor repairs to it, when an artillery spotter aircraft passed overhead at great altitude. I don't like the look of him, the sergeant farrier said to Matiska. They both grabbed their mess kits and ran across to the field kitchen to collect their midday meal. After all, one never knew, 
but the British artillery spotter's radio was even faster. Like a tornado, the first salvo roared through the air. Heaviest naval caliber, 200 yards behind the chateau, the shells came down. A wall of fire and dirt rose up as high as a house. Then silence. Then came the second salvo. The gable of the chateau crumbled and crashed down. Officers and other ranks came tumbling out of the doors and leapt into the anti-shrapnel slit trench which had been cut right across the forecourt. Gruppenfeuerer Witt, the divisional commander, had just reached the trench. He glanced back to make sure none of his men had been left lying injured. When he saw Matiska pressed against the out, side wall he shouted across to him, Over here, Matiska, into the trench. Matiska raced across like a sprinter. The third salvo was coming over. He tripped and fell headlong into the trench. Now Wit jumped in himself, and then everything was swallowed up in noise, fire and smoke. Private of SS troops, rank in SS troops equivalent to Lieutenant General. When Matiska had dug his way out from underneath the rubble and dirt, the first thing he saw was the dead body of his divisional commander. The effect of the 16-inch shell was indescribable. It had burst right on the edge of the trench. Matiska staggered among the dead bodies. He took another step and then dropped into the vast void of unconsciousness. This disastrous incident demonstrated the terrible threat which the heavy naval guns represented to the fighting line and to headquarters. But Hitler could not make up his mind to use the V-1 against the fleet. He continued to put his hope of political results above the most pressing military requirements. Admittedly, the V-1 bombardment was beginning to unnerve the Londoners. Service mail captured by 84th Corps conveyed a good idea of the morale in England. An assistant in a department store, for instance, described to her fiancé the scene in London during the opening days. Almost noiselessly her account ran like little airplanes the missiles come gliding over. They burst first in one place, then in another, scattered all over London and make large craters. Buildings collapse, it's terrible. Another letter revealed the emergence of a general sense of insecurity, Extensive areas of central London were being evacuated. One woman correspondent gave as her new address a small town on the Tyne, near the Scottish border. The British public was demanding that the danger should be eliminated by the capture of the launching sites. Highly critical remarks were being made about the inch-by-inch -inch offensive, for once the placid English were grumbling quite a lot. Hitler, however, refused to see that the V-1 offensive, if only because of their inadequate numbers and their insufficient accuracy against specific targets, would never induce a resolute British government to ask for terms. Even on June 17, the date of his first and last visit to the invasion front, he still believed that the V-1 bombardment of London could decide the war. Again, he declined to use the weapon against the English south coast ports. It was incomprehensible, Rommel warned and Rundstedt warned, but Hitler viewed the situation optimistically. We only have to keep our heads, he harangued the marshals. As for the situation on the Russian front, he believed that there was no serious danger there. Hold the enemy in the east, defeat the enemy in the west, was Hitler's strategy. If we ward off the invasion, Britain will sue for peace under the effect of the V weapons. But even while Hitler tried to inspire his marshals with this thesis, the first explosive charges were already being detonated in Russia on roads, bridges, railway tracks and supply depots. With these explosions, the Soviet partisan detachments were ringing up the curtain on the Russian summer offensive on the central sector of the Eastern Front. Four days later, this offensive burst forth on both sides of the Smolensk-Minsk supply artery and caused the collapse of the line held by Army Group Center. Where are our airmen? In the early hours of June 18, the troops in their foxholes on the Tilly front were woken up by a tremendous concentrated artillery bombardment. The earth was shaking. Then came two British divisions of the 8th British Corps, reinforced by newly landed armoured brigades. Under cover of the naval guns creeping barrage and the aerial bombardment, the British attacked. The first wave broke against the ruins of Tilly. All day long fighting raged around the shattered walls. In the evening they were lost, Christo was lost also. But the enemy had not yet broken through. The main line, withdrawn behind the ruined towns, was still intact. Again and again each yard of ground was contested in bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Again and again there was concentrated shelling, fighter bomber attacks and aerial bombardment. Casualties were mounting. It was only a matter of time before the Palmer Lair Division and the 12th SS Palmer Division would be annihilated. 
The ceaseless artillery bombardment and the continuous waves of aerial attack would slowly but surely wipe them out. Whenever enemy aircraft streaked low over their positions, whenever bomber squadrons droned overhead in formation, the wretched troops would curse, grumble or groan in despair. Where on earth are our airmen, and where is that damned Luftwaffe of Göring's? To this day, former participants in the invasion battles find their hackles rising when they think back to those days. They felt let down by the German Luftwaffe, betrayed and sold out. It was a rare event even to see a single German fighter or bomber anywhere over the front. But then, what could the German airmen take up? There is an illuminating passage in a secret analysis of the invasion battle, submitted to the chief of the Luftwaffe General Staff. The second fighter Geschwader had an average of 30 Ma, chines available, but there were days when of the entire Gesch. Wader only eight machines were operational. The majority of the fighter aircraft not operational could have been got ready for action within 48 hours, provided the necessary spares had been available. But these had been withdrawn from depots in Western France because of the priority given to the fighter defence of the Reich. And with what results? These two are mercilessly exposed in the report, we read for instance, the air officer commanding 3rd Air Fleet reports, ground installations being systematically smashed, especially all fighter fields. The chief of operations of 3rd Air Fleet reports, enemy carpet bombing raids by four engine formations at first only in daytime, but now also by night, especially against transport installations. Ratio of air strength, generally 1 to 20, during major operations about 1 to 40. The second fighter corps reports, own filter operations now only conditionally possible. Effective reconnaissance and fighter operations entirely ruled out in the invasion area. 30 Anglo-American airfields already constructed and operational in the bridgehead, it was complete surrender in the air.